On the 4th of May, she set out to go to work, pretty much as usual. Then she just disappeared. Hey everyone, I'm Kevin and welcome back to Just Thought Lounge. This is the true crime channel that delivers well-balanced, serious coverage of the cases that really make you think. Our case today takes us to Bonnie, Scotland in the spring of 2010. It's a regular workday morning in the city and in the shadow of Edinburgh Castle and the Scott Monument, the regular workday morning plays out more or less as usual. But for one city resident, Suzanne Pilly, a 38-year-old bookkeeper who had worked for years at a firm in the city centre, it would be the last day that she would ever make the trip into her office. Suzanne's disappearance amongst a bustling city on a Tuesday morning is as baffling as it is unsettling. When the investigation made the fateful turn from a missing person to a murder case, law enforcement was faced with a daunting task. How do you prove a murder case with no body, no forensic evidence, no witnesses to the crime, and a suspect maintaining his innocence? The investigation into Susan Pilly's death has been called groundbreaking by the police, astonishing by the media, and commendably thorough by the trial judge. Let's take a look. The firm where Suzanne Pilly worked as a bookkeeper, Infrastructure Management Limited, or IML, was located on Thistle Street in the heart of Edinburgh, the picturesque Scottish capital. On the morning of the 4th of May 2010, Suzanne was making her way from her flat in Sauton, about a half an hour by transit, to Edinburgh city centre to begin work for the week. It was Tuesday morning, following one of the first spring holidays of the year, and Suzanne was optimistic for a fresh start. She had spent the night with a new boyfriend, Mark, and things were going well. At 8.36 a.m., she happily texted a message to her mother about her budding relationship. Suzanne was seen by a neighbor of hers leaving her flat that morning and then catching a bus near to her home. She transferred once to get a second ride into Princess Street, where she exited the bus as per her usual route. Now on foot, Suzanne is captured popping into a local grocery shop, a Sainsbury's, located on the corner of St. Andrew's Square and Rose Street to purchase a yogurt and then onwards in the direction of her office building at 11 Thistle. A CCTV camera catches her walking through St. Andrew's Square, after which she should make a left-hand turn onto Thistle Street. From this turn, it should only take her roughly six to seven seconds to reach the entrance of her office building. The last image at 8.53 a.m. that morning from security cameras across the street from Suzanne's office building track the figure to the IML entrance. But there is no image of Suzanne actually entering the building. There is a gap in CCTV coverage of the entrance to 11 Thistle itself. Cameras are focused on either side of the doorway. One shows the figure approach the gap where the doorway sits, then disappear. Suzanne is not seen appearing on the camera on the other side of the entrance, and she is not shown backtracking towards St. Andrew's Square. The only logical conclusion is that she has entered the building via the doorway, not covered by CCTV. But, by noon on that day, Suzanne's colleagues inside the office were getting increasingly worried about where she was, because Suzanne did not turn up for work that day. Suzanne was an unfailingly happy person. 38 years old, she was very active and loved being outdoors. She was engaged with many charities and loved being involved. Her first marriage had ended in divorce years earlier, and in the aftermath, Suzanne had remained sociable, open to dating, and optimistic. She was well-liked at her work, and those that knew her found it extremely uncharacteristic of the bookkeeper to be absent without explanation. By 12.45 that Tuesday afternoon, no one had been able to reach her by phone. Her colleagues were concerned enough by then to contact her parents. Suzanne's parents were also unable to reach her. She had abandoned money, her passport, and her cat at her flat. They reported her missing to the police at 8 p.m. that evening. Edinburgh police turned up at the IML office the next day and spoke with Suzanne's co-workers. At least they spoke with most of them. One of the company's directors, 47-year-old David Gilroy, was out of office that afternoon on a business call up north in Argyle. David had been headhunted to join IML as the regional operations manager in late 2008. On that day in the office in May 2010, staff at IML directed the attention of police to Suzanne and David's firm email accounts. It was clear that the two had developed a romantic relationship. David, however, was married and had two children. 
Their affair had begun in 2009. The two had connected socially following an after-work party when David was still pretty new to the firm and getting to know everyone. He was an engineer and a 10-year veteran of the Royal Navy. David once received an award for bravery from the Edinburgh police after chasing a burglar through the streets. But reports of his affair with Suzanne revealed a very different picture of the veteran. The relationship was turbulent and frequently underwent periods of on-again and off-again exchanges. After David's wife had learned of the affair, he moved into Suzanne's flat with her for short periods of time. In April of 2010, Suzanne reported that she thought David was acting overly jealous and was checking her emails. Friends of Suzanne said she had been clear in the days leading up to her disappearance about breaking things off with David. She told one friend in a text message the Friday before that she had got through to him about it being over. In a message to her new boyfriend Mark on the holiday Monday, she said, at least if anything, I managed to drum through to David that it's over and to leave me alone. But was it over? It seems the relationship may not have had the clean break that Suzanne had claimed. Or perhaps these messages were wishful thinking. On the Sunday morning, David had texted Suzanne to get together. She initially dismissed him, letting him know that she may have a date lined up, but she eventually conceded and the two met up at her flat at about 6 p.m. that night. Security footage from a local shop shows the two together purchasing items to make dinner that evening. They ate a homemade curry and David spent the night. On Monday morning, David left Suzanne's flat at roughly 10 a.m. after things yet again turned sour. Messages to him that day from Suzanne accused David of ruining her chances with her new boyfriend and having never been willing to commit to her. David reportedly returned home to his family that day with a bouquet of flowers in hand for his wife. He spent the holiday Monday gardening, he said. In the month leading up to Suzanne's disappearance, David Gilroy texted and called her over 400 times. On Tuesday the 4th of May, however, amongst heightened concern across the office about her whereabouts, these messages from David ceased. One colleague claimed that David did ask about Suzanne once that morning, but David does not call or message Suzanne himself. David says this is because of a promise he made to his wife the day before when she took him back. No more communication with Suzanne. To outside observers, however, including law enforcement, this change in behavior was extremely suspicious. The desperate tone of his previous messages suggested he was not likely to happily cut off contact anytime soon. Hi Suzanne, it's David here. Uh, give me a phone back, please. I just wanted to have a wee chat with you. Um, you know, see if you need a lift or anything. Just give me a phone back, even just for a couple of minutes. Um, yeah, I'm worried. The sudden lack of communication was interpreted as a sign that David was the one person who knew, from early that morning, that there was no reason to message Suzanne, because she was already dead. After learning of the affair, police were keen to speak with David as soon as possible. David was left multiple messages from police in Edinburgh while on his business trip north in Argyll. At 11pm that night, David arrived at Kostorfin Police Station in Edinburgh for questioning. His subsequent interviews with investigators took hours, and David submitted to these talks voluntarily. While speaking with police, they noticed some distinct markings across David's hands and wrists. David consented to an examination by a forensic medical examiner. He had a number of injuries to his forehead, hands, and arms. On the back of his right hand and wrist were parallel curvilinear abrasions, which could have been caused by fingernails. According to a consultant forensic pathologist, such abrasions were a characteristic reaction of a person who was being strangled. When he was taken to police headquarters to have these injuries photographed, the photographer further noticed that David appeared to be wearing makeup on his hands, an attempt to conceal these defensive injuries, they thought. Hundreds of cameras and hours of CCT footage from across the city were scoured by police to recreate Suzanne's last recorded movements and to determine when she may have gone missing and where. Six cameras traced her movement from Princess Street, where she exited the second bus on her way to Thistle Street before dropping out of sight only feet away from her office door. Once investigators were convinced that Suzanne had made it to IML that morning, they set out to recreate David's movements on the same day. David did not take his car into work that Tuesday. He also rode the bus, arriving at work at 8.36 a.m. and logging into his computer at 8.40. Between 9.15 and 9.20, David was spotted by a coworker near a photocopier, which sits near it to a back staircase that extends across all floors, all the way down to the garage in the basement. 
One witness says he is certain that he saw and spoke with David in the second floor office even earlier at exactly 9 a.m. when he first arrived to work that day. This leaves a window of time between Suzanne's assumed arrival at the entrance at 8.53 and David's sighting in the second floor office at either 9 a.m. or 9.15 in which an encounter could have occurred. Some colleagues who see David after 9 a.m. also noticed that he appeared clammy and sweaty, as though he had been rushing around. Later that morning, at about quarter past 11, David excused himself from the office and took a taxi to his mother's house. She in turn drove him to his home where he collected meeting notes that he had forgotten and claimed to need at the office that afternoon. Notably, he then drove back to the office in his own vehicle, a silver Vectra, and arrived at about 12.30. David is seen returning to the car park on more than one occasion that afternoon. Once at about 1.30, he says he returned to grab some money from inside his car. He then used the cash to pop down the road to a local shop where he purchased a handful of items, amongst them, some air fresheners. Police dogs trained to identify and react to the presence of dead bodies were taken to the office building at 11 Thistle. The focus is on the basement and the parking garage. The basement is composed of a small utility room, an open car park, one small office space that was unoccupied in May 2010, and a rarely used stairwell that led to the upper floors. Buster the police dog reacted to an area in the garage as well as in the basement under the stairwell, and a recessed area near the door leading from the basement into the garage. In addition, the dog also signaled to his handler that he picked up a scent in the boot or the trunk of David Gilroy's silver Vectra. Investigators determined that David must have waited just inside the door to the building for Suzanne to arrive, meeting her at about 8.53 and convincing her to talk privately in the basement. Once downstairs, the conversation grew heated, they said, and David lost his temper. He killed Suzanne, sustaining the many scratches to his hands, then he hid her body under the stairwell and returned to work. All of this occurred between 8.53 and no later than 9.15 a.m. Once back upstairs, David was said to have booked a meeting for a visit to a client further north in Scotland for the next day. The drive would take him through the vast and dense expanse of the Argyle Forest. Then, with his meeting in place, he made an excuse of the forgotten notes at his home in order to leave and retrieve his vehicle. At some point in the afternoon, he relocated Suzanne from the nook under the stairwell into his trunk and then disguised any scent with air fresheners. The next day, he took his silver Vectra north to the highlands Suzanne hidden away in the trunk. David's car is caught on camera leaving that day with an umbrella sitting in the back window. When his car is later seized by the police, the same umbrella is found sitting inside the trunk. Investigators conclude that it was moved temporarily to make room in the trunk of the car. The vector is processed for forensics. However, aside from Buster's key nose, investigators come up empty. There is no physical evidence found in the vehicle to indicate that Suzanne was ever inside it. In the basement, the floors were scanned, the walls scraped, everything is checked and thoroughly processed in anticipation of physical evidence supporting the narrative told by the CCTV cameras and the police dogs. But neither David or Suzanne's DNA is found anywhere in the basement either. The issue here is that if the authorities' theory is correct, David needed to drag or carry Suzanne across the distance of the floor to the stairwell, which would also require negotiating a fire door, moving across the unused office space, up three steps, and then around a tight corner, and then doing so again in reverse later that afternoon, all without leaving the slightest physical evidence or being seen by any witnesses. On Tuesday night, David left the office before 5 p.m. In the same silver vector that he had taken to work that day, he went to a parents' event with his daughter and then took her and his wife to dinner at a local Italian restaurant, returning home by 9 p.m. The car and its contents sat parked in his driveway all night. The next morning, David drove back into the office. At 11.30 that morning, he left for his meeting at a school up north through Argyle in Loch Gilbhead. Various CCTV recordings of David's car en route to Loch Gilbhead revealed that he had taken much longer to complete the journey than would normally have been anticipated. A team of 20 officers scoured over 250 cameras to retrace David's journey and uncover two missing periods of almost two hours in his drive. He arrived at around 4.30 that afternoon to inspect the football pitches at the school. He had taken two hours and 38 minutes to go from Tindrum to Inverary, a journey which should have taken only 36 minutes. His car had used more gas than might have been expected on the route as well. 
Overall, the drive to the school from the city took David about five hours each way. In both legs of the trip, it took David an extra hour and a half to cover the same short stretch, the one that covered in the vast Argyle Forest. In these winding, often narrow highland roads, there are countless trails and offshoots to turn onto and into the trees. Some of these paths are conducive for travel with a small vehicle, and many are not, but there is no shortage of options. It is here in the vast expanse of the Scottish Highlands that investigators believe David Gilroy placed Suzanne Pilly in a shallow grave hidden in the hills. Her body has never been found. Scottish investigators lacked forensic evidence at the crime scene. Months of searching had failed to recover Suzanne's body in the Argyle Forest, and David Gilroy, much to the disgust and growing animosity of the UK press and greater public, continued to proclaim his innocence. He was nonetheless arrested and tried for murder in 2012. Initially, at least, his wife and family stood behind him. The lack of physical evidence was thought to make the case very weak. No one believed that a jury could find him guilty. In the Scottish court, the jury of 15 members had three options. They could render a verdict of not guilty, a verdict of guilty, or a verdict of not proven. This third option is what Sir Walter Scott, one of the more famous of the Scots, called the bastard verdict. It is generally applied when the jury believes that the defendant is guilty, but that the Crown simply hasn't proven it. David's defense team was so certain of the failure of the Crown to make its case that they did not call him to the stand. Less than a day's worth of defense testimony took A simple majority of the 15 members is all that is required for a conviction. The jury heard about how David abruptly stopped messaging Suzanne on the morning she disappeared. They heard about his sudden trip to Argyle the next day instead of staying to assist police in their efforts to find her. And critically, the jury also heard about how a three and a half hour trip took five hours each way. David's car returned with vegetation found on the undercarriage. It had four fractures to three suspension coils, which was determined to be odd for any car subjected to only regular road use. This was argued as clear evidence that the vehicle had been taken off-road. The jury also heard how he had lied to his wife about carrying on the affair, had acted jealous towards Suzanne, and had likely invaded her privacy by reading her emails. They heard from co-workers that had long since turned against David and spoke of his appearance that morning, describing him as a man in shock, whose eyes were glazed over, pupils dilated, and otherwise appeared sweaty and unwell. David was convicted of Suzanne's murder in April 2012. His sentencing was the first in Scotland to allow TV cameras into the courtroom. In May 2010, she was starting a new chapter in her personal life. And that included bringing to an end her relationship with you. On the 4th of May, she set out to go to work pretty much as usual. Then she just disappeared. And the jury were satisfied on the evidence before them that that was because you murdered her and disposed of her body. On charge six, the charge of murder, I sentence you, as I am required by law to do, to life imprisonment. Having regard to all the circumstances, I order that you serve a punishment part of 18 years, which will be backdated to 30 months. By the time of David Gilroy's conviction in 2012, detectives had carried out inconclusive searches across hundreds of square miles of remote mountains in the southwestern highlands of Argyle in hopes of recovering Suzanne's remains. On six occasions, the police have investigated discoveries of other human remains in the region, but none were Suzanne's. Had David taken the stand, he might have attempted to explain a few pieces of circumstantial evidence that was otherwise damning. First, David insists that he had persistent car trouble on the trip up to Loch Kilped, causing him to pull over and fuss with his vehicle at a few points along the road. In addition, he says he stopped for some food once or twice, all of which accounts for his missing time. There are no witnesses to confirm these stops, though there are none that spotted him drive off-road either. Email exchanges from the week prior show the rescheduling of his meeting for the Lock Ilped project. It appears to have been placed in his schedule before Suzanne's disappearance and not last minute as an excuse to drive north. 
He says now that the makeup that the police photographer found on his hands was the result of testing fake suntanning products at the mall over the long weekend while shopping with his children. Although these explanations may be believable, or rather plausible, the police still found no indication that any gardening had taken place at his home that weekend to cause the scratches in the first place. The linchpin of the Crown's theory of guilt rested on the CCTV footage that placed Suzanne at her office building that morning but failing to make it to her desk. But what if Suzanne did not make it all the way into the office? The last images that have been released of Suzanne are of extremely low quality. The expert at trial testified that these images of a figure walking down Thistle showed similar traits to those of Suzanne, but could not definitively say it was her, not to the same level of certainty as the other CCTV images. Additionally, the time codes of these cameras looking into Thistle Street had a wider variation than those that tracked Suzanne to that point. The critical timestamp of 8.53, when synced back with these security systems, allowed for a range of plus or minus one minute. What that essentially means is that the figure shown walking down Thistle Street could align with Suzanne's journey or could be someone else entirely who happened to walk down the same street in the direction of multiple offices within the same two minute window when Suzanne was expected to have done so. There is evidence that investigators looked into other scenarios in the early days of the investigation. An appeal for information was published based on CCTV footage of two people walking down the street that morning. One of the two individuals was thought to have entered a small blue car that was parked on Thistle Street. The car would not be at all suspicious if it hadn't, within the time frame that Suzanne was anticipated to be in the area, left its parking space on Thistle Street, sped out at an increased speed, made an illegal turn, and then caused the abrupt braking of a city bus to prevent a collision. There has not been any further information released in connection with the vehicle. David Gilroy failed in his appeal in 2012. He continues to argue his case through the Scottish Criminal Cases Review Commission, known as the SCCRC. An initial review of his case was adopted in January 2015, but after two years it was announced that the review was closed and it was not recommended to the High Court. David Gilroy can continue to place his case to the SCCRC, but would likely require more compelling new evidence to be successful. A new law proposed in Scotland called Suzanne's Law would compel anyone convicted of a murder in which the body has not yet been recovered to reveal the victim's location as a key component for their release on parole. David was jailed for life in 2012 with the possibility of parole after 18 years. Should Suzanne's Law be adopted during his prison term, David Gilroy would have no choice but to admit his guilt if he was ever to be released. Alternatively, if David holds firm to his claim of innocence or is truly not guilty of the murder, the law would mean that he is likely to spend the rest of his life in prison. I think every time she's mentioned, you struggle with the fact that she's not been found. I think it's hard to think about her because we just don't know where she is. And that's the first thought that comes in to your head when she's mentioned is just, where are you? The search for Suzanne's remains is still active and ongoing. So that is the story of the disappearance of Suzanne Pilly and the murder conviction of David Gilroy. Thanks once again for joining me to examine this case today. I'm Kevin, this is Just Thought Lounge, and I'll see you in the next one.